Hey guys, this is GKCS. In this video, we'll be talking about availability in distributed systems. Specifically, we'll be talking about how to make systems more and more available. This is something that engineers fantasize about, but the idea also is that we want to bring in some practicality, keeping in mind the cost and the complexity that you introduce when you're trying to make your system extremely reliable or extremely available. Now, depending on your organization, you may find certain levels of availability acceptable for yourself. Uh, if you're a startup or a medium-sized organization, I mean to say a thousand to one lakh users, usually two nines of availability, which is 99%, two four nines of availability is totally fine. You have scheduled downtimes, you have unexpected downtimes. 99.9% .9 is, let's say, the minimum. If you have three and a half days when your system is down, it's really going to impact your reputation, even as a startup. People will consider... You know, if I purchase this thing for three days in a year, I won't be able to use it. What if those three days are when I really need it? And also, of course, you lose customers. The moment they see that your page is down, they don't say, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. They just say, oh, okay, let's never come back here again. For medium organizations, having a downtime of one hour a year is totally fine. You may have this scheduled downtime. You may have it unscheduled. People will not be too upset with you for such a problem. The way you do this is making your systems highly reliable, either using a cloud solution provider or investing heavily in your own engineering capabilities. This means that you remove all single points of failure through redundancies or cluster architectures. And most importantly, you have monitoring systems, which ensure that you're able to catch an error quickly and then look at resolving it. Finally, you have mature companies who are highly reliable. This is at five to six nines. Five nines is, I think, a practical situation where you have Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, five minutes of downtime a year is fine. Worst case scenario, you're down for five minutes. It's not that big a deal. You can also aim for six nines of availability, which is almost no downtime in a year. If you spread it across the entire year, then a person may not even be able to understand when the system is down. They're just going to hit the refresh button and see the website is back up. They'll feel like, or it was a problem with my network connection instead of you know your server. After this comes a little bit on the theoretical side for app developers, uh, but it's very practical if you're building a pacemaker or some sort of a medical system, which <laughs> can't go down for three seconds also, right? If your heart stops beating for three seconds, it's a really big problem. In that case, you are looking for very high levels of availability. Uh, in fact, zero downtime systems is something you might want to look into. A GPS is an example of zero downtime system. You also have predator drones which are flying around in the sky. Uh, if they are knocked out for a minute, then they're just going to collapse. So in these cases, zero downtime, or very, very low downtime systems uh, is what you're aiming for. So how do you choose what you should do? Let's take a war story. Let's try to understand what concepts or principles we should apply when we are faced with this situation practically. This is our startup interview ready. We have one server, which is running a monolith application. We have one cache, which is an in-memory cache. So the cache also runs on the server. There's no Redis or anything. We have a CDN, yes, that is a CloudFront which is backed by S3. And most importantly, we have a database, which is Postgres. And this server was hosted in the US. The reason for this is basically we did it wrong. As a startup, we were trying to spin up a database and we chose USA region. Yeah, that sounds pretty fast. Let's just add it. But most of our customers are from India. If there are customers in the US, we try to cache responses in memory and serve them quickly. But since 60 to 70 percent of all requests come from india it makes sense for us to have the database in india to reduce response latency so what do you do so at this point we made a decision to migrate the database that we had in the us to india and here's the step-by-step -step process the first thing we did was to test whether this is possible on staging so the database in us was migrated to a staging database in India and this went smoothly. This was not very hard. We had to read some documents in AWS and took about a day to do. The next thing we did is just migrate the database from USA to India. Keep in mind that this is not real time. Of course, this Indian database now has all records up till this point, but the server is still pointing to the US database. So all new users are still being onboarded over there. You just have most of the data, the last two years of data, all in India, but Two years and three days is now in US. So you're missing on those three days. And so these databases are not consistent. At this point, there were many ideas to improve the consistency between the US and the Indian database. One of the ideas was to keep a trigger in the US database, which says whenever there's a create, update or delete in this original database, you can send that request to the Indian one. Another idea was to use a third party change data capture solution. Another idea was to use a AWS in-house data migration service. But we kept things as simple as possible. We'll run an SQL query later. Yeah, we don't need a trigger. We don't need bin log from MySQL. We don't need anything. Just need a simple SQL statement. Now we need to switch this pointer in the server 
from the US database to the Indian database. So the second part of the migration comes in, which is downtime. So what we did is we first saw how much downtime do we need to migrate all the records for like a day from USA to India. And we saw that it's a startup. It takes less than a minute. Uh, but of course, we connected with users and said that, you know, there'll be a downtime for 15 minutes. We took some buffer. And then we updated the website banner saying that, you know, the website is going to go down in three hours and then two hours, 59 minutes, and then so on and so forth. We also had an email notification that we sent to all users. Time we chose was pretty interesting. We chose 2 p.m. Indian time, weekday. Interview ready means that people are preparing for interviews. They don't usually do that in office at 2 p.m., right, lunchtime. So that was a good time for us. Also, everybody in USA is sleeping and everybody in India is awake, but they are not working on their interview preparation. But the benefit here for us is that our team is well awake. So I don't need to call them at 2 a.m. in the night unnecessarily. And the fourth thing is we had a war room. A war room is a place where all of us get together. For us, it was a Slack huddle where we ensured that the things are working fine. Finally, we made this transition from the US to Indian database. And here we kept things as simple as possible. A single SQL query migrated all the differential records from USA to India and then we killed the USA database, we saved some cost there. Now if you're looking for principles that highly available systems employ, here are five which can really help you. The first one is simplicity or perfection. You don't want a zero downtime system for most applications, you don't really need it. Or there is absolutely no difference between the data here and the data here even for a split second. You don't need that. You don't need that kind of consistency. In certain cases, you can take down your system for three hours and nobody will notice. Or in certain cases, you can take down your system, have a crudely, eventually consistent system running in place. Maybe your cache is serving all the requests and nobody will notice. The second thing is downtime over loss. If you're going to have data loss as a result of some flashy algorithm, it's better to sacrifice availability than durability. In general, users like their history or their data to be recorded in your system. They're okay seeing the system is down for five or 10 seconds, but they're much less happy if they see that something that they did has been missed. Also, you want lesser moving parts. Generally, what happens is whenever a person is thinking of high availability, they just add more redundancies. Like, okay, this is going to have a primary replica architecture. This is going to have another failover, another backup. If you have many moving parts in your system, often what ends up happening is the chance of it failing increases. Uh, and usually redundancies don't bring in an increased chance of failure, but they're useless. What you ideally want to do is keep your system, again, as simple as possible. So the number of lesser moving parts you have, the number of lesser things you have to think of, the more reliable your system is. The fourth idea is relevant to medium to large sized organizations, in my personal opinion, right? It's chaos engineering or practicing failure. The concept has been popularized by Netflix, who say that if a part of your system fails, that is perfectly normal. In fact, it's so normal that you should practice taking down a part of your system. Take down one server in your system, right? That's Chaos Monkey. Take down a region in your system. Okay, that's, that's I think, Chaos Gorilla. And then you have a bunch of these failure tools which you can employ and consistently your system is made to fail to check whether it can recover from that failure in production. In this way, of course, you can be extremely sure that your system works under heavy load or unexpected circumstances. For a small organization like a startup, it's best to either take these benefits from a cloud solution provider like AWS or you can ignore it for now. You know, some downtime for a startup, as you'll see, is maybe not that big a problem. Number five is incident reports and root cause analysis. This is usually useful for large organizations where the context is sometimes lost or there are lessons that you can derive from every failure. In Google or Uber or Facebook, whenever there's an issue, a report is made in which a detailed analysis is given as to why this incident happened. There are some techniques for this, like five whys, and the root cause is identified. The idea is to tackle the root cause of the problem, not necessarily the symptom, but the core problem creator. Uh, let's say you have this system where clients are connecting to your server, which is backed by a database, and one of the clients has an issue. It cannot connect to your server because of some network problem. Practically, as a person, if you have a problem with one of your routers at home, you may have a backup router which you connect to, or you connect through your mobile network. Networks also use backup routers, which redirect your request to any given server. So let's say you're trying to connect to IP address 192.52.0.0. If one of the routers which promised you a path to that address fails, then you can try the next router, which says that, yes, I also have a path to that address. So the idea here is redundancy. If something fails, then you have a backup route. The one thing you have to consider is cost. There's lots of algorithms here, minimum spanning tree, minimum spanning tree with faults, uh, many practical aspects of graph algorithms can be brought into networks. 
networks are a mature concept and because the costs are so high for getting the routes slightly unoptimized also that it makes sense to use these algorithms here. But the concept is pretty simple. You just want your systems to work with the minimum cost possible and low latency. Of course, you can also have a problem in one of the components of your own system. Let's say your server crashes. Here, the usual idea is to have some sort of real-time redundancy, which means you have multiple servers which are serving requests. And if one of the server crashes or is unable to respond to your request, you retry to another server. A concept of retry is here, but there's also the concept of load balancing. The Indians are probably connected to the Indian server. If they are unable to connect, then they go and hit the US server. The benefit here is that you can add and remove servers from your configuration dynamically here. So if there's too much load on one of the systems, it dynamically routes to another system. Finally, you come to the most dangerous kind of fault that you can face as a engineer, which is your database is collapsing. So in that case, usually you have a redundancy mechanism, which is a replica. So while this DB is running, it constantly sends messages to a replica. The replica is consistent with the primary database. So when there is a fault, the replica can be promoted to primary and the server can redirect all requests to this replica, which now takes all read and write requests. The benefit of this is that the switch is really fast. It's a very common architecture. So most cloud solution providers provided, I wouldn't say most, I would say all cloud solution providers which are worth using provided AWS, GCP, everybody does. In fact, many systems also use this read replica. They don't let it go to waste. You have servers which are connecting to this read replica to do select requests on your database. And when there's a create, update, delete, you send it to the primary always. You could also go for a cluster architecture here in databases. Uh, this is the main idea of distributed systems. Most NoSQL databases provide this, Amazon DynamoDB, Cassandra. One of the problems with this is usually these systems are eventually consistent uh, and they also have their own set of complexities. As a small company or a startup, you don't really want to do this, but yeah, as a large company, it makes a lot of sense to invest in these kind of solutions. Now, another place where there may be a fault and your availability doesn't really matter is caches. So if your cache, let's say, is not responding to a GET request, it's all right. You know, uh, you can call the database and get the request. You're basically paying more money. You're having high latency for doing this kind of an operation. But in some cases, that's okay. You expect the cache to recover by itself. If the cache doesn't recover, you can rebuild the cache. Just restart the server, which is hosting the cache or clear the cache using some sort of remote procedure call to the server and you're back in business. So that's it for availability in distributed systems. This is an interesting concept. Uh, if done right, then it can really help you. If done wrong, <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. And as an engineer, it makes sense to either reuse some of the already highly available systems out there. And if you can't, then it's good to have a principled approach to this problem. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you have any doubts or suggestions. You can leave it in the comments below. Until next time, see you. Bye-bye.